Peace everyone. So today I'm going to go over all of the different types of medications and procedures that take place during a standard hospital birth. I've been working as a doula for some time now and just about every second time mother has said to me, I don't know what they gave me at the hospital, but XYZ happened and I didn't like it. And in my opinion, this has to change. This is why there are support people available for the birthing mother so that they can stop the medical provider and ask them, hey, what are you giving her? Is she aware of it? What are the side effects and reactions of this? Does this cross the placenta and does it affect the baby? These are all important things to do while in labor and delivery room, but it's even better to know ahead of time to have a good idea of what to expect. So first we're gonna start off with Pitocin. This drug is a synthetic oxytocin and is used to speed up labor or induce labor, and it causes the uterus to contract. Pitocin has shown that it causes more harm than good during labor, but is still primarily used by doctors. A, ma a major risk for the birthing mother is increased pain with contractions, and due to the increased pain, it's more likely that pain medication is used to help her manage the pain. Another risk for the mother is that it can cause prolonged contractions and contractions with double peaks. One important thing to note about Pitocin is that when you are using it, it does require you to have continuous monitoring to detect any type of complications and to continue to up your dosage until your contractions start happening more frequently and your dilation increases. You should also know that the baby is at risk with the use of Pitocin due to increased chances of depressed heart rate patterns, fetal distress due to decreased oxygen, and overall an increased likelihood of a C-section. Due to the drug Pitocin causing the uterus to contract, it is forcing your body to go against its own rhythm, thus making it more painful. Lastly, Pitocin should never be used with the VBAC due to it overstressing the uterus. Next, we have a oxytocin drip. This drug is used to help labor progress faster and it can make your contractions become stronger as well as closer together very quickly. Due to this, it is required that your baby be monitored closely using an EFN monitor. The oxytocin drip can also cause impairment of the fetal heart rate and hyperstimulation. So with hyperstimulation happening, it can be harder to have AV back due to the increased pain, tension, and stress when having those stronger contractions. Again, because this drug makes your labor faster, it causes contractions against your body's rhythm and this can make your labor longer and more painful. Next, we have Demerol, Morphine, and Fentanyl. These drugs are given to you if requested to help you relax in between contractions. They're simply there to just take the edge off and they do not provide any type of pain relief. Some of the possible side effects of the drug to the mother would be temporary nausea, dizziness, and a high feeling. Uh, lower blood pressure, lower heart rate, respiratory depression, and a slowing of active labor. The biggest concern I would say would be the slowing of active labor, and that can possibly lead doctors to call for a C-section after a certain period of time. Some of the side effects to the baby are changes in the heart rate and poor suckling once born. These are strong drugs, and you should be mindful that your baby is also being passed a slight doses of these drugs if you do receive them during label, labor. Next is one that we're all familiar with. It's a epidural. The epidural is probably one of the most common drugs used during labor. It's a narcotic and a local anesthetic combination that's used to relieve pain during labor, and it generally takes a few hours to wear off. This drug can make your legs, stomach, and chest feel numb, and your legs especially may not feel as strong as they normally do. Uh, because of this, you will not be given permission to walk during this time unless you do opt for a walking epidural. Some of the possible side effects to the mother are nausea, vomiting, dizziness, slowing of labor, and a decreased urge to push. The reason for the decreased urge to push is due to your legs and stomach area being numb, you can't really feel your contractions as well, so you can't take cues from your body when to naturally push. So this causes the, doc the doctor to tell you when to push, and that can be pushing against contractions, which can lead to unnecessary tearing of the perineal. 
Another side effect of the epidural is a headache that can last for up to 12 to 48 hours. And possible side effects to the baby are decreased alertness, fussiness, and irregular heart rate changes. Next, we have uh, one that's become really popular lately in hospitals and birthing centers. It's nitrous oxide gas. This is a tasteless and odorless gas that is used for pain relief during labor, as well as reducing stress and anxiety. Generally, a mass is given to the birth and mother, and she'll hold the mass on her face when needed during contractions. She'll inhale the gas for approximately 30 seconds or however long the contraction lasts. Some of the side effects to the mother are a feeling of dizziness or nausea, and it's reported to go away within a few minutes. Another would be a feeling of drowsiness in between contractions. And at this time, there are no known side effects to the baby when using nitrous oxide gas. Okay, so next we have, forgive me if I butcher it, it's prostaglan E2, also known as Prepadil or Cervidil. This can be inserted into the, into the vagina as a gel or as a removable tampon. It's used to soften the cervix. This can lead to uterine hyperstimulation and fetal distress. And in some cases, due to that fetal distress, it can cause a C-section to be required. Next, we have prostaglan E1, which is also known as Cytotec or Misoprosto. This is a tablet. So this tablet is only FDA approved as an oral medication for stomach ulcers. The manufacturer does not formulate it for the use in labor because of quote unquote safety concerns. This drug has been used in hospitals during labor and has shown a significant adverse effect such as hyperstimulation of the uterus and this can turn into sustained contractions, which are contractions that last longer than 60 seconds and can lead to fetal distress. Not only should mistoprosto not be used by pregnant women, but it is not safe for VBAC at all. So those are the most commonly used drugs during labor. Next, I'll go over some of the procedures that are done directly before labor or during labor. First, we have the electrofetal monitoring, which is known as EFM. This is a device, you've probably seen it during your prenatal visits. Um, it's used to monitor your baby's heart rate if there's any type of stress on your baby so that any potential problems can be identified before they become a threat. EFM is not required for low risk pregnancies and it's recommended mainly for women who have had prior cesareans or are at high risk of complications. With having an EFM on you during labor, it does restrict your movement and depending on the hospital or doctor, you may be required to stay in bed unless you have a wireless monitor. Next, there is internal monitoring. This is used to record your baby's heart rate once labor has begun. A small wire is attached to your baby's head or buttocks through your vagina to do so. There is an increased risk of bacterial infection and an increased risk of C-section with this procedure. Next, we have episiotomy. This is where an incision is made to enlarge the vaginal opening during delivery. Studies do show that without an episiotomy, tears are generally smaller and they heal more quickly than the average episiotomy, which can take up to three weeks. Tears and episiotomies are stitched up following delivery with self-dissolved stitches, and the procedure does carry a risk of infection. Lastly, we have the artificial rupture of membranes. This may be done uh, directly before you go in for labor just to try and get you uh, sped up for labor if you're at 40 weeks or if the baby is considered quote unquote big. This is also known as the breaking of waters. If your water doesn't break on your own, then your doctor or midwife may choose to artificially rupture the membrane using an amni hook. This is usually a painless and it may induce your labor. This is this also holds a um, increased risk for infection with this procedure and it does increase the odds of abnormal fetal heart rate as well as a cesarean section for fetal distress. So with those last procedures that I mentioned, anything that is being inserted into the vagina at this point does carry an increased risk of infection, just because you shouldn't have anything going up in there at that point in time. 
So I know this was a lot of information, but the goal here is to provide you with the facts so that you can make informed decisions before labor and even during labor. So I hope you found this video very helpful and until next time, peace.